Hi, Georgia. Welcome to Speak as a Leader podcast. I am so thrilled to be talking to you. This took a little while. It was a little bit in the making, but we're here now and we're talking and I am excited for this conversation. Ah, Najin, thank you. It's really great to be here and thanks for the invite to come and talk to you. Absolutely. You have had a fascinating journey spanning multiple countries and continents in your professional life. So tell us a little bit about your journey, specifically talking about the parts that led you into leadership. So I have had a fabulous winding career and journey that's taken me to all different parts of the world, from Africa to the Middle East to Asia Pacific what I actually do is I help sales teams and organizations to maximize their business results and create positive impact for the clients that they serve. And I actually do that through my focus on transforming skills and cultures that allow people to really do their best work. And I've been doing that, you know, around the globe and predominantly in the tech and education industries, most of that time in sales enablement roles. So sales enablement is an area that I'm really passionate about, as well as, as you know, you know, inclusion and the power of connection and you know, collective knowledge. Recently, I actually had a very deja vu moment. I walked through the shining doors of the IBM Australia South Bank office as a new joiner again, 17 years after I first did it as a fresh faced grad. So I've had 12 years living and working in the Middle East and Africa and back to IBM Australia where it all started for me in my professional career. And I'm now leading sales enablement for IBM across ASEAN ZK. Um, So that's ASEAN countries and Australia, New Zealand and Korea. So it's all feeling very full circle at the moment. That's amazing. I I love people with you know, multicultural background in terms of your work experience and your life experiences, because it really lends so many different dimensions and nuances to to our lives, to the way that we approach the world, really building in our tolerance of different worldviews. So do you remember a time, for example, where you had culture shock? Because I'm asking this because, you know, I've been living in China for eight years and I definitely had a lot of yeah. moments of culture shock. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, there's been so many. I, I couldn't even list them all. You know, I, I remember the the biggest of them all, though, I think, was after I was living in Africa for, for quite some time and I came back to Australia. And I just remember how kind of spoiled we seemed, I literally remember following a group of kids along in the mall and they were teenagers and I was listening to kind of the conversation that they were having and I thought, wow, you guys, you have really no idea how the real world is after living in somewhere where poverty is is really high and a lot of the things that are taken for granted in the West are, are not readily available. And I remember that was just the, the biggest shock and from a work sense as well, you know, there's there's so many cultural differences there in terms of, you know, how you lead, how you communicate and all the different nuances there. Absolutely. That was, I think, one of my biggest culture shocks when I came to China, just the sheer difference in terms of how people communicate. There was this one particular thing about Chinese culture I don't know if this is true for all Asian countries, but it's very true for China, where they just give criticism. They're not really fans of like, you know, the sandwich technique and, you know, wrapping everything up nicely and talking about the good parts first. No, you and I was in the creative industry, so I was really working on these videos for clients and I remember when we would share the videos with them as deliverables, they would just come back with like pages long of just critique, fix this, fix that. This is not nice. This girl is ugly. This is bad. This is bad. And it was, I remember I was just taken aback by that because I was so used to the American culture of, you know, sandwiching Mm -hmm. your, your criticism and feedback. So absolutely. There's, there's so many differences in communication styles. Yeah. And and as jarring as that is, I think there's something that can be really refreshing in it as well. So I'm Australian. Australians are naturally direct, probably not as extreme Mm -hmm. as that example. Um, What I found in, in Nigeria when I went, they have either ends of the spectrum. So people are either full on in your face direct, they will tell you exactly as it is, no holds barred, 
or it will come from the other side and it will come with a huge long story and justification to kind of get to the point and there's no in between. So that was wow. really interesting to to adapt to that. And then did you change your communication style accordingly? I I had to. I'll um let me share a, a story with you. You know, Nashina, I'm pretty big on failure and we know that failure is such a great way to learn. And there was there was a time when I first went uh, to Nigeria, I was working with some really senior public sector clients and stakeholders, and it was my turn to stand up and do the big presentation. And I had it all sorted. I had my pitch down pat. I had wonderful slides. I knew what I was proposing was really going to land with them. So I was super excited to do this pitch. And I stood up in the front of the room and I started delivering my presentation and I looked out and there were just this sea of blank faces staring back at me. And so kind of automatically I'm like, okay, I'll just bring more energy and amp it up more. And I kind of continued and pushed on and looking out again, it, it was the same blank stares. I, I was mortified. I even saw one guy look at his phone. I'm like, oh, my goodness, what's going on? And um, the colleague who I was there with, she was American and she kind of saw what was happening or maybe she saw my desperation and she kind of got up and she said, oh, what she said was, and then, you know, she delivered the message and, oh, wonderful, everybody cheered and, yes, that's exactly what we need. Meanwhile, I just wanted to vanish. So my very Australian accent, far less Australian than it is now, could not be comprehended. You know, I was also delivering fasts in Australia. Some people talk really quickly. So hearing this accent that they were not used to delivered like at this rapid fire pace, nobody could understand what I was saying. So from there, I had to readjust kind of the whole way that I spoke and that I presented so that I could be understood. You know, I changed the way I said my vowels. I slowed down my pace. I even did, you know, my hand gestures differently so that it worked culturally. So that was a huge, a huge learning. And every presentation I did kind of since then, I always found, you know, somebody from the local team to practice on first. So I didn't have that same awful experience again. <laughs> That's such an amazing story and such a hard lesson for you to learn the hard way. <laughs> yeah. But I think we've all I had that imagine. moment, right, when you're up presenting and you just feel like, oh, I'm just dying here. This is not going as I hoped. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, and once you learn that lesson, that is it. Like it, you commit it to memory. You will never make that mistake again in front of any other audience that is, you know, mm -hmm. that doesn't share the same culture as you or doesn't share the same like, level of language fluency as you. I think exactly. I, I made very similar mistakes in China as well. You know, when, when we learn how to present and how to train, one of the first things we learn is you must engage the audience. The audience mm -hmm. must be there with you and they must respond mm -hmm. to you and that's how you know they're with you. And the first time that I made a, a more of a public presentation here, the audience was just quiet. Because in mm. China, they think of speeches and keynotes and even workshops as lessons, as mm -hmm. lectures. They even call you teacher. Even if you're mm -hmm. just a trainer or a person who's come to deliver a guest talk, you will be teacher. So they're well. very used to a one-way communication. And I also mm -hmm. learned that the hard way. No matter how many questions I put in there, no matter how much I try to interact with them, there was silence. Sometimes I got some chuckles here and there, but mostly no one wanted to engage. They were actually shocked that they were expected yeah. to engage because it was so different from what they were used to. So, wow. so many that cultural it, differences. Yeah, and really, really tricky as a presenter facilitator, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, you have to come up with ways that will make them engage in really, really simple ways, really simplify it, make it super, super easy for them. And also, like you said, not just slow down, but also check in with them. And this is something mm -hmm. that I might not necessarily do in the US, for example, because it might even be taken mm -hmm. as offensive if I say like, can you all understand me? Is everyone here with me? But in China, it's mm. perfectly normal and no one takes offense if you say that, is everyone understanding me? Is it okay? Should I slow down? Yeah, but how nice is that? Like, shouldn't we really do that in any context? Not maybe ask, should I slow down if it's a 
you know, an English speaking country, but, you know, are you understanding? Are you with me? Like that's, mm. that could be really impactful and really help people's um, learning too. Yeah, exactly. Especially if you can ask it in ways that would be culturally appropriate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So switching gears for a bit and going towards mm -hmm. leadership, because we talk sure. all things communication and all things leadership on this podcast. I would love to know if you had what I call a switch flip moment where you've been managing people, you've been a boss, and suddenly a switch flips and you realize, wow, I'm actually a leader and I need to stop doing what I was doing as a boss or as just a manager. Mm, I have had a few, a few moments like that. I'm going to share one and it's probably one that a few of your audience might be able to relate to. And it hit me like a real a real slap in the face. It was a shock for me. And I was part of a discussion. We were making some pretty big decisions around an opportunity that was available. And I was, you know, listening to the conversation and the conversation was really just um, kicking off. And on a prompt, I shared my perspective. And then bam, it was done. The decision had been made based on what I said. I was really shocked because, you know, I was used to working in environments where you discuss, you debate, you challenge one another. I certainly wasn't the SME in the room. Obviously, I was being seen as the leader. And then that just made the decision final. So it really taught me that you really need to be careful about what you say um, and how you say it to make sure that you know, you're not shutting down other conversations. And I think this is probably true for both managers and leaders. But where I've seen it most is when it is that someone who is perceived as the leader or the person who should have the final say says something and that's it and there's nothing further. I think that's really dangerous because you really want to, you know, allow others to share their perspective, particularly if you're not the expert, and more like collectively reach that same end point rather than having someone coming in and, and just tell you. That's, so that was my story. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. That really shows me that you're a very inclusive leader, that you want the voices of your team members to be heard and you don't want to be just the person that says, do this or do that. Yeah, I think it has to be, doesn't it, in this day and age? Like the world has changed. You know, it doesn't matter how senior you are. You know, you still need that buy-in and that support and that willingness of people to to help you succeed and to do things for you. And we know that when people feel included, they're much they're much more likely to do that. Yes, that's that's really what we would assume. But it, I'm interested in knowing, have you ever gotten pushback on that? Have you ever gotten people coming back to you and saying, okay, Georgia, it's great that you want our opinions to be included, but what do you think? Is it, you know, can, <laughs> yeah. can you decide for us? Can you just make yeah, this decision? For sure. Yeah, and this is different personality styles and you want all those different personality types and different ways of thinking in your team. And there are definitely people who, you know, and I've had people say to me, just tell me what to do. You know, like I'm, they're not interested in, you know, thinking about it deeply and coming up with recommendations. They just want to know, you know, is it A, B or C? So definitely it, it comes up. I think it's, um, you wouldn't want to make that assumption for people, but I think once you know the team, you know, of course you continually want to challenge them to come up and, you know, think for themselves. But there are some people who are, you know, happy just to go with that direction and of course there are times too when you need to give that direction and you know and make those those decisions also i think it's even you know when we think about the role of a leader i think it is more about this um inspiring and motivating and making sure that people are connected to that bigger picture or that bigger vision you know or what it is that you're trying to achieve so i think when you are kind of communicating really inclusively it, it just helps out a lot more and that's a great point that even if you're the one making the decisions, it's still up to you to communicate those decisions effectively and transparently, because a lot of the times mm -hmm. people, you know, in the ranks down the line, aren't even aware of what the priorities are, what is the company's yeah. vision and how is it linked to what they're doing? How is it trickling down? And it makes probably makes them feel that their work isn't significant enough or meaningful enough to contribute to the company vision when that's not yeah. the case. 
Yeah, it, it's so true. And, you know, I think we all know that communication is just so important, you know, particularly in positions of leadership. And I've been really lucky to work with a lot of amazing leaders at IBM. I've had some great, you know, managers as well and some terrible ones too. But I think what really sets apart those who are, you know, just next level in terms of leaders is how they communicate and communicating at all different levels and making sure it's clear. And we know that for businesses, you know, to win teams to be successful, everyone has to be aligned to that same goal. So, so important that we're clearly communicating that. Yes, absolutely. And so I actually stepped away from a corporate role and I stepped into the startup world and that was a mm -hmm. huge change for me because in the corporate world everything is very clearly defined there are systems for everything and they have mm -hmm. been put in place long before you joined you just have to understand them and then put them into practice and in the startup world this it's completely different you mm -hmm. have no systems and it's like a jungle and everyone is used to different kinds of processes everything is very patchwork and ad hoc and just slapped together and that's where I really understood that a part of a leader's job is also to put together those systems or ensure that if the systems are in place, ensure that they're being followed. Have you ever had situations where, you know, you found that the communication was just broken? Hmm broken well I think no communication is like broken communication but I really love you know what you said about you know this slightly more chaotic you know startup environment and I think it's you know good communication is even more important in that context right when things are rapidly evolving and and changing you know sure maybe what you communicate is out of date in two days time but that you know that communication needs to be there and there are people who thrive in that chaotic kind of startup environment and even within a startup there'll be other people who are to bring out their best work you know they will need that stability and understanding of the focus and 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 what's happening um but yeah in terms of poor communication i i've the big one is just lack of it you know not enough mm. communication around what's happening and not to the right people that makes a lot of sense and i've specifically seen this in bosses versus leaders this is you know a distinction that i love making and i think we've had a lot of interesting conversations about this already on linkedin that mm. i've often seen that bosses communicate very little or just enough that they think is enough to get the job done and i've often mm. seen leaders almost even over communicate they will talk a little bit about what led them to making this decision or where the company is going and where it's at. Mm -hmm. Have you ever experienced this shift? Have you ever found yourself not communicating enough and then step back and realized, I need to talk more about this or I need the team to know why this is happening? Yeah, I, I've done it myself and I've seen it as well. I think it can be really easy in this day and age when everyone is just so time poor you have to prioritize things. So, you know, I work in a big sales organization. So do you prioritize, you know, um, working on a, a deal that's happening or do you prioritize, you know, getting a communication out to your team? So often, you know, it can be easy to get so busy with what you are doing and what you're impacting. You know, it's easy to forget that, you know, you need to come up and communicate so that everybody else can also be doing their, their best work. So again, you know, that communication is just needed to assure that people are aligned to the strategy, that bigger picture, particularly in this day and age, you know, when, you know, getting and retaining the right people for the jobs is more important than ever. You know, to your point, people need to understand what the bigger picture is. They need to understand, you know, what it is that your company is really doing, their role in it and what difference they can make. So if they're not brought into that bigger vision, you know, they'll be out the door when the next company, you know, shows up with, you know, 10k more for them yeah so true i think communication adds accountability and responsibility and this is also a lesson i learned the hard way when i became a filmmaker i was i was directing the set but i was doing it as just kind of like a, an extended one-man show because i was used to that yeah. from from my film student days and i didn't realize that the crew that i had hired they needed to be briefed in detail prior to the shoot. And I was, 
just I'm just it's a, it's a weird mistake to make now that I, I think about it. But at the time, I thought, yeah. sure, I know everything. I know the script inside out. I'm just going to direct people as we go along during the day. And I found that I had just put all that responsibility and accountability on myself. And it was exhausting because mm -hmm. I was the, the set Bible. I was the one that everyone had to come to all the time because only I had all the answers. And as a leader, you yeah. don't want to be in that position. You don't want to be the person who always has all the answers. I think that's definitely a mistake that a lot of young leaders or young managers make maybe. Yeah, I, I look, I, I think it is. And your example is a great one. You know, we you hired, you know, that production team because they were the experts and you needed their help and you needed their knowledge and you needed their expertise to have a great movie at the end of it. It's the same in any work environment. You know, you have these people in your team because you need their expertise to achieve what it is that you want to achieve. So, yeah, super important message. Yeah, it's it's very interesting when you're looking at it in retrospect and you realize that there are all these things you stumble through and you really thought that you knew what you were doing but you actually didn't and then you realize this is probably what a young manager or a young leader is feeling right now there is mm -hmm. that what would you call it i think there's probably a name for this right this kind of false complex of i've done so much specifically if they've achieved a lot at a young age Mm. I've done so much. I know how things work. I know what I'm doing and I'm going to keep doing it this way. So there's almost that notion of you don't know what you don't know. I don't know if you've ever mm. felt like that. Yeah, I um I get the sentiment. I think there's always this there is always something more to learn, you know, and you need to always be aware of that. You know, you could think Nasheen you are at the top of your game as a presenter you have made it you have nailed it you are done you are a fantastic presenter and then maybe you see someone else who's just taking it to a whole nother level and you're like oh, okay I you know there's a few things that I can brush up on I think it's the same in leadership you know it it's mm -hmm. who who you surround yourself with who are you learning from you know who have you got as a mentor who can kind of help you get out of that potentially being stuck in that, you know, this is how we're, how I've always done it kind of mentality, because there's particularly now, you know, look at social media and LinkedIn, there's so much expertise that you can tap into to help kind of lift your game. So if you are a new leader and you are that person that Nishan just described, I think get out there and find some great resources and some good people to connect with who can share some tips with you. And the value of mentorship like that you brought up is invaluable. It's just priceless having a good or several good mentors in your life. I remember mm -hmm. one of my first mentors was actually my boss's boss. And mm -hmm. there's a story I love telling about how when I was at a crossroads, I really thought that I was very lost and I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if I wanted to switch departments or switch companies. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand if what I was doing was what I was meant to be doing. And mm -hmm. at that time, this person was 22 years senior to me. They were the country manager at our headquarters in Pakistan. And they told me that all you have to do is make up your mind because I believe that you have the skill set to excel at whatever it is that you want to do. Mm. But your indecision is what's standing in the way in between you and you achieving your goals. And such meaningful advice that you know i remember it now it's probably been about 17 or 18 years since yeah. he said that to me so have you had mentors in your life especially ones that you will never forget yeah so what a great story that must have been a fabulous mentor i think we've all had those kind of moments where maybe someone who has more life experience than us who's more senior than us just has those little nuggets of of gold I've had, I remember early on in my career, I I kind of stumbled my way into finding mentors. I never, when I was starting out, purposely went out and sought mentors. But naturally, I would kind of find myself aligning to one leader or another who would kind of take me under their wing and, and, and help me. And one of those was one of our sales leaders. And I remember, you know, I was talking to him about then, I, you know, I wanted to get a promotion and I wanted to get more money. And he said to me, he said, 
you just have to make sure you're fairly compensated for the value that you'll bring. And that was, for me, that was like a, a mind boggling thing. Like, yeah, if I'm doing all this amazing stuff, why should they not pay me what they would pay someone else to do that? So he was one of my my standout um, mentors. That was Shane. Now I'm back in Australia. I actually just looked him up. And as per usual, he had all kinds of great advice and good little nuggets to share. That's that's amazing advice, especially for women, I think. I always right. feel like we we hesitate in asking for, for what we think is fair compensation, thinking that, yep. is it really fair? Maybe I have a different idea of what fair compensation yeah. is and someone else does. <laughs> the kind of yes, things that men never ask. Yeah, that that's it. Oh, maybe I'll seem too pushy. Maybe it's yeah. too much. This is, yeah, it's I'm being a major too greedy. Issue. Yeah, yep, huge, huge issue, <laughs> huge yeah. issue. We could have a whole other conversation around that one. I think. Yeah, yeah, so true. Is there? While we're on the subject of gender, this is also something that fascinates mm -hmm. me. Would you say that there is a difference in how different genders communicate at work? specifically in terms of the kind of impact that they make and what has it been like in your experience? Hmm. I feel like women and men have different natural communication styles, like they have different natural leadership styles. And of course, I'm, I'm generalizing here, but there are some pretty stark differences. But in terms of the impact that they achieve in the end, I'm not sure that there is a significant impact. So when I think of amazing leaders who I've been working with, with sometimes, you know, starkly different um, uh, communication styles, it hasn't really impacted, you know, kind of the end result. But it's the feeling that comes with it. It's that sense of um, inclusivity that comes with it. And I say that because as women, as leaders, we are often naturally more kind of um, inclusive and more communic communicative terrible word in how we kind of say things and you know we lead differently and I think that kind of impacts the communication and it also has you more open to to feedback and you know allowing people to um, really open those channels for two-way communication which is also really important as well if you want to communicate with impact it's got to be you know it's got to be two-way it's not just somebody sitting at the top not listening just sprouting you know whatever they whatever they feel you know they should be at that time. That's a very interesting perspective that there are different styles, perhaps inherent styles or learned communication styles and that, that differ uh, when it comes to different genders. Mm -hmm. But at the end, someone who is impactful is impactful no matter what, regardless of their gender. I just wonder yeah. if women have to unlearn some of the things that we learn early on in life. I know that I've definitely yeah. gone through that journey where I wasn't taught to be super sure of myself. In fact, mm -hmm. I was taught kind of the opposite, you know, keep mm -hmm. your ego in check, make sure that you're not the most arrogant person in the room. Don't be so sure of yourself, Nasheen. Make sure mm -hmm. that other people don't call you out on your opinions because you could always be wrong. And that oh. seed of doubt that is in your head, it really makes you feel like, yeah, it's probably me who's wrong. It's probably me. So let me just not talk. Let me just not express my opinion because I could be wrong and someone could call me out for it. And oh my God, that would yeah. be a disaster. Oh God, that's just heartbreaking. You know, it's, you know, having someone do that overtly is, you know, just, you know, could be shattering, you know, to, to anybody, particularly, you know, a, a young woman. I think as well as people overtly doing it, it happens kind of subtly as well. And through mm. culture and nuances, it doesn't have to be called out. You know, I I spent the first 10 years of my career having two different versions of myself. There was the work me where I tried to fit this mold of uh, a woman in the tech industry. I was young back then. And so I felt I needed to act and behave in a certain way you know, because of the culture that I was in, because of the environment and because of, you know, all the signs that were coming through me, you know, and, and cues from everything that we absorb around us. 
Whereas when I was at home, you know, or the other me, it was very different. And so having these kind of two different versions of yourself going is, it's exhausting for one. And I'm saying this as a, a white, cisgender, English speaking, middle class, you know, Australian. So where it becomes really worrying is think about all those different intersections of diversity, the different people that come in. And so if I was feeling like I need to fit this certain mold and I need to totally cut off whole parts of my personality and my life, that's a problem when most of me in the, is pretty acceptable, you know, in the mainstream. And so I think it's really, really something that is a problem for, for a lot of people. I've seen it change so much in the last five years, though. And I think from a Western standpoint as well, COVID it has done a, a great job of mushing everything together, you know, with people working from home. There isn't, you know, that separation between work and life has been merged more than ever. And pretending, you know, I, I've, I used to go to work and I would never talk about my kids. I would never talk about my family. Even if someone brought it up, I, you know, I wouldn't, kind of go down that path for this fear of not being seen as professional. So this is a real a real kind of worry. More recently, I actually had a conversation with um, somebody and she said, oh, I feel like I need to wear a blazer whenever we meet. And I thought, again, this is like that societal conditioning that, you know, because I'm quite efficient in the way that I do things, you know, rather than showing kind of my full personality it's all serious and it's all business in every meeting whereas the real me is kind of not that at all so it was a bit of a, a shock and it made me reflect on this you know having different versions of myself and and realizing that I need to bring more of the me you know into work and into everything that I'm doing if I'm not doing that what example am I setting for other women coming up for other people you know who don't maybe fit that mold so I think we all have a responsibility to kind of show our full selves, you know, flaws and all and every multifaceted, complicated, messy part of our lives. That's awesome. I love that so much that we have a responsibility to show all of ourselves because no part of our lives should be taboo or hidden or we shouldn't be ashamed of having a life or having a personal life, being mm -hmm. a human, not being a mm -hmm. work robot. It's, yeah. I, I had a very similar experience, different and similar at the same time, where I didn't realize I was doing this. And this was my own company where I was coming into work every day and I thought I was creating a professional working environment. And I remember this one time, one of my team members said, Nasheen, are you like this with your friends? Do you ever make a joke? Mm. Are you ever lighthearted? And it was such a huge shock to me because with my friends, I'm always cracking jokes. I'm always the mm -hmm. one that has a weird sense of humor. I've done like stand up comedy and gotten up in front of people and told jokes. So yeah, I had no idea that I was not including that part of myself when I came into work every day. It was such yeah. a huge eye opener. Wow. And you were like denying all of your work colleagues the opportunity to get to know like the real you at a real human level. So I'm glad that's changed. <laughs> I think so. I think I've really learned uh, to embrace that. I think part of that was definitely the fact that I was, I was the boss. I was mm -hmm. the, the CEO of the company, even though we were a very tiny company, but still I, I always felt like I have to be serious and things are serious, mm -hmm. it was, which is entirely not the case. You can have a lighthearted approach to work and still be extremely professional and have mm -hmm. an impact. Those two things are not mutually exclusive at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally, totally agree with you there. So let's switch to public speaking, which is mm -hmm. one of my, my passions. And you've done a lot of speaking and training and presenting over you know, the course of your personal, um, sorry, the course of your professional journey. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in knowing how has that evolved over time? Tell me a little bit about how, if you remember the first time that you spoke in public or the first training that you had to do, how did you feel? And how do you feel now when you have to speak in public? Hmm. You know, I, I can't actually remember the first time that I stood up and I, I spoke in public. I It has been a huge journey for me, you know, the speaking. 
Um, and I'm still obviously working to improve on that and, and build on, you know, my expertise in that area. But I do remember, you know, really early on in my life, I realized that there's great value in being able to just stand up and communicate to people effectively. So I think from that lesson that I had, it really encouraged me to do more, to do more of it. And I think so many times, and honestly, even now, sometimes when you're presenting, you know, for me, I, I can feel really nervous and anxious. And when we think about preparation, you know, when you're you're super prepared, it's more of a feeling of excitement than one of that, you know, when you're kind of thrown on the spot. I don't know about you, but I'm not that person who is amazing when just put on the spot. There are some people who can do it so brilliantly, but for me, I like to be kind of extra prepared. And when I'm not, you know, all that nervousness kind of kicks up and, you know, and kicks in when you're starting. But of course, you know, if you have a, a good opening, you know, from there, you know, you'll be able to calm down the nerves and everything kind of rolls on. You know, I remember um, one presentation that I gave and it, it was quite short, but I wanted to make sure that it had a really a good impact and that the message was communicated really well. And I spent a lot of time thinking about what it was that I wanted to communicate, how I was going to communicate it, how I was going to connect with the audience. And once I figured that out, I then started practicing. And so I practiced in front of the mirror and I practiced with my mom and I found somebody who I considered to be an amazing presenter and I practiced with them. And when the day came to actually deliver that presentation, I felt that surge of energy still, but it was excitement. It wasn't nervousness. It was that really feeling of, wow, I've got this and this is going to be great. And that was such a nice feeling going in rather than that, oh, you know, that angst and that nervousness that that can also come with it. But of course, you know, that took a lot of extra effort and a lot more preparation. And in our busy lives, we don't always have the time to, um, to do that, unfortunately. That's such a great story because it really tells me a lot about you as a presenter and you as a public speaker because i was going to ask you are you more of an improviser or more of someone who likes preparing and i absolutely know the answer now <laughs> that you're yes. way more comfortable when you prepare yeah way more i i work with some really amazing salespeople, and some of them in any situation on any topic any size audience, you could just say, right, go. And they will charismatically, clearly, brilliantly, you know, with confidence deliver their their message, you know, at a, at a second's notice. But I am, yes, definitely not that person. <laughs> and that's perfectly fine. The link that you made between preparation, knowing your material, knowing how to deliver it and having rehearsed it specifically with a live audience, that really does give you a lot of confidence. It really does mm -hmm. make you feel like you've got this. You're not doing it for the first time. You're not delivering this material for the first time. And you really know how to play with it. And I think that is really where the magic happens on stage, mm -hmm. where the presenter is so comfortable with the content that they're not worried about delivering it anymore. They're worried about connecting with the audience or that is their mm -hmm priority. And I've often seen a lot of people really do the opposite. They, they will be mm. working on their PowerPoint, you know, like minutes before they need to present. And I yeah. never understand that. Why are you subjecting Ugh. yourself to that kind of stress? Because at that point, you're going to be reading off of the slides. And that's yeah. not going to make an impactful presentation. If you have to look back every single time and read off of something, then I mean, you're not really adding a lot of value by being there. The audience can read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've heard you um, kind of talking about this, and I think it's so true that need to connect with the audience. The other thing is it's, it's so natural for many of us in the corporate space, and I don't think it's just in, you know, IT, to focus on the slides. So let's say for that presentation that I had, you know, the former me probably would have spent all that time doing the most amazing, beautiful, outstanding slides you have mm -hmm. ever seen in your life. And I wouldn't have really thought, how am I going to communicate it? How am I going to engage my audience? So if you're just working on your slides, stop and think about <laughs> what it is you want to communicate and how you're going to. Yeah, absolutely. It's, 
I just, I, I never understand why people don't spend as much time rehearsing their delivery as they do on the actual slides because they're, they're equally important. And actually, if you poll audiences, they will remember the delivery more than, than the content a lot of the mm -hmm. time. They will remember mm -hmm. the attitude of the speaker, how the speaker made them feel, how the speaker mm -hmm. entertained them. They will forget what was on slide 57. Yes. So it's yes, mind boggling. It's so true. It is. It is. And more than ever now, we, we want to be entertained as well. You know, so it is not about sometimes the facts. As you say, it's about how you made, how you make people feel. Very true. And that's, that's really where emotion comes in. Just another thing mm -hmm. that, that I love talking about because in specifically a lot of tech presentations, you don't see, feel, or hear emotion. It's just lacking. It's just think A and B and C. And it's basically like delivering this information from one bot to another. Like, here is the information. Mm. I am delivering it to you. Please receive it. Have you received it? Okay. <laughs> You can ask them to confirm. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, it's so easy to kind of forget so much of what we do. It, it's human to human stuff, right? It's about, you know, connection. And even when we think about, you know, salespeople these days, you know, my focus in my job, I, I work with a lot of salespeople and help them be more effective at what they do and the results that they can drive. But so much of that is not just about the technology or, you know, the the features of it. It's about how you're communicating that message to your audience. You know, do they trust you? Do they think you're an expert? Do they see value in what you're offering? But having that relationship is really key most of the time, or as you say, the connection. Yeah. And this is a really important point. Communication and sales for me would seem very kind of inextricably linked because if you mm -hmm. can't be a good communicator, you probably can never be a good salesperson. So I'm curious to know, have there in, in all your work across different sales teams, across different geographies, are there specific communication mistakes that you see salespeople making or sales teams making over time and over different geographies? Yeah, there are. There's quite a few. <laughs> um, one that I think is most common is the same challenge that I had back in Nigeria, my major public speaking fail, which is failing to adapt, you know, what it is that you're pitching to your audience. You know, that is just just everything. You could have the best, you know, solution that you're offering in the world, but if you're not articulating that in the context of your potential buyer in a way that they can understand, it's a lost opportunity. So I think that is, that's probably the, the big one, you know, and to do that, it means you need to understand, you know, your prospective clients, you know, what's going on in their company. You need to understand the industry. If you can understand them as a person or have some basic rapport with them, you know, that's even better in this age, you know, a huge percentage of the actual sales cycle is now done online. So many of us, we go and fully research whatever it is that we want to buy before we, you know, even engage, you know, a potential vendor. It used to be vendors would be engaged much earlier. So you have a lot more time to kind of communicate and work with that that prospect. But now you have to go in and make a, a really big impact and do it quickly and do it later in the sales cycle. And you can only do that if you're really offering them help and value because they've already made all the simple decisions themselves. They need you to add something extra. That makes a lot of sense, knowing your audience inside out. And this is something that I tell my clients that you should never make the same presentation twice. Even if it's the same content that you need to deliver, the moment you're delivering it to a different audience, it cannot be delivered in exactly the same way. You cannot replicate it word for word because then you're not doing justice to the situation. And the situation is there's someone else at the receiving end, not person mm -hmm. A that you had talked to earlier or crowd A that you had talked to earlier. So you can always make changes. It's like a stand-up comedian, you know, doing sets in, in different cities or different mm -hmm. countries. They will have some content that is similar and then they'll add on like local flavor. They'll find out, mm -hmm. oh, what do people joke about here? What, what does everyone love? What does everyone hate? And then they like mm -hmm. add that in and the crowd goes wild. 
they think that this person's talking to us. They've come here. They don't mm. even from here. And that's really what makes an impact when you can be mm -hmm. that personal, specific and adapt to that audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> so you talked about creating impact and creating that authority. And it's a very interesting point that you brought up that now more than ever, the sales process is way more challenging because people aren't introducing their product anymore necessarily. The person that's interested already knows about the product, already has that basic information. So how do sales teams adjust their speaking styles, their communication styles to have maximum impact and maximum authority when they speak? Mm, great question. I think there's lots of different tips and techniques, you know, that you could list off for people in terms of bringing authority when you're, when you're presenting. I think in terms of dealing with clients, a lot of it is even more about building rapport. So yes, you want to be seen as an authority. You want to be seen as an expert in what it is that you're covering, but it's not that same authority you know, that it used to be is very different. You know, you need to be seen as a as a partner, somebody that they can work with. And some key ways that I think, it, you know, that that could be done are to, you know, make sure that, you know, yes, bring the value. That's the number one thing. So understand, you know, your potential client, bring value to them, making sure that you're communicating really clearly, that it works for your audience and that it's two-way communication. So the best salespeople do the least talking. They're the ones asking the right questions and they're gathering information from that client to help really understand what's going on with them. That makes so much sense. This is, again, something that can be applied widely to public speaking because when you're on that stage, you're not just there to speak or to have this monologue delivered to the audience. You're there to have mm -hmm. a dialogue and being able to listen however you can through your ears, through your eyes is vital to creating that kind of dialogue and creating that kind of connection. So that makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense that a great salesperson would be able to listen more than they actually speak so that mm -hmm. the person they're talking to actually feels like they're they're being heard, their concerns are being heard and hopefully eventually addressed. Yeah, exactly. And then you're really understanding, you know, what's really going on with the client, right? And what their real problem is you know, to address. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And in terms of just wrapping up our conversation, I want to ask if you have any interesting or any funny stories that have to do with public speaking or communication, maybe an early story um, or something that might have happened recently that you mm. remember either it can be you speaking or it can be something that you've observed as an audience yeah, member. Look, oh, I'm not sure I can top my, my Nigeria fail story. That was like my <laughs> biggest, my biggest failure. I look back on it now and it was funny, but it, it wasn't at the time. That's for sure. So I think that one is it. You know, <laughs> that's a, a big um, fail story for me. <laughs> that was an awesome story. Oh, something that I'd actually I, that, that came to mind when you were talking about um, sales and making that connection. Mm -hmm. Do you know how they do that in Chinese cultures? How the sales Tell connection me. works? It's through drinking. <laughs> <laughs> and there is this famous kind of uh, business wisdom that is passed down to you if you're, for example, a foreigner entering the, the Chinese work um, environment, this piece of business wisdom is that a Chinese person will not do a sales deal with you until they've gotten you drunk and <laughs> talk to you about business and life drunk. Oh, I love it. That's so great. <laughs> now, I'm not sure it applies to all cultures, but I know, you know, <laughs> since I've recently returned back to Australia and there is a really big element of the, you know, going out for drinks, you know, with your client as well. But that's a fantastic, fantastic example, Nasheen. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not too great for the liver. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Yeah, it's 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 very much a, a thing specifically like more old school and traditional Chinese businesses always mm -hmm. worked in this way. And they always thought that 
you really see a person's true nature when they're inebriated. So get them drunk and then see their true nature. And then we'll figure out if this person's worth investing in a long-term relationship with. Mm -hmm. It just gets, wow. it gets very taxing though, if you have to have one sales closing deal after another over alcohol. <laughs> That's what I was just thinking, you know, end of quarter could be really, really tough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very challenging. So we've come to the end of the podcast episode. Thanks so much, Georgia, for a great conversation. We covered so many different things and I loved hearing about your stories, hearing about all the experiences you've had in communication and in public speaking and leadership. Do you have any closing words for us? Anything you want to leave us with? Um, um, so thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure. All I would say is, you know, give it a go. Presenting can be really daunting. And I think a lot of us naturally just shy away from it because of that feeling of, oh, I'll get to, I'll be too nervous or I won't be good. I think just do it anyway. You know, if they have the opportunity to practice, do it. And you will naturally just get better, you know, the more you do it. You will get better for sure. And it's about being strategic with that practice. I think that is something I always mm -hmm. like pointing out that you have to first get started. So get started anytime, get started as soon as possible. And then be strategic about the way that you rehearse and practice. Try to address mm -hmm. the opportunity areas early on so that you don't develop bad habits. So that can also kind of carry over into your speaking style without you even knowing about it. So that's great mm. advice. Thanks, Giorgio. Thank you so no, much for you. being here. No, my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on.